Hello, everybody. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about the nitinol alloys that uh, we have seen improve ductility in comparison with the conventional alloy. And I want to cover also uh, possible mechanism for this improved ductility. So I will start directly with the results. As you can see, this is the mechanical properties during the tensile of the nitinol alloys with the nickel rich 50.8% of the atomic uh, percent. So this alloy was first uh, aged at 575 degrees C for two minutes. And uh, this is the black curve that you can see here. And we have deformed and it was fractured in the kind of 15% fracture strain. We did the same material aged at 575 degrees C, only one minute different, three minutes. And uh, you can see that it went far to the kind of 45% elongation and fracture strain. So it was very interesting for us to see that only with one minute difference, we see this change of mechanical properties and let's say elongation of the material. So in order to see this transition, we decrease the resolution or let's say increase the resolution of the aging and we start to age it at the shorter times that you can see here that uh, we have the elongation with different aging times and also we have UTS as a red curve. That you can see that uh, after different aging times for two minutes and uh, 20, minute, uh, 20 seconds more, it starts to increase the elongation or the ductility of this wire. But the UTS keeps constant until that it reaches the maximum at around three minutes aging. So we try to do the the same material with different temperature to see that if we can see the same kind of the behavior or not. And we decrease the temperature and as you expect, if you want to see the same behavior, we need to longer times. Based on this, we age it for 15 minutes. Again, the same kind of the fracture strain around 15%. But if we increase it to 30 minutes aging, it increased to the, some kind of the same as the 45%. Again, in order to get a better idea of when it happens, we did in the different time scale for the aging. And you can see again that for the elongation or the ductility of this alloy, it start to increase after 15 minutes. And uh, it reaches the maximum of the elongation around the 30 minutes for the 540 degrees C. So we want to understand that what's going on only with one minute difference in the aging, what's the mechanism behind that it shows very uh, larger elongation. So we made a, a TM sample from the sample that is aged 575 degrees C for three minutes that shows the larger elongation. And this is before deformation, only after aging. This is the bright field image in the left that you can see the shape of the grains and uh, the blue circle shows the diffraction patterns are taken from this region that in the right side you can see the diffraction pattern. As you can see, on behalf of the also the P2 uh, uh, reflections that you can see as an intense reflection, we have also super reflections. That is the indication of the formation of the uh, nickel 4 Ti3 precipitates. That you can see uh, six super reflections that is kind of the 1 over 7 in the direction of the 3 to 1 that is shown by the dashed red line with the arrowheads. So based on this, before starting the formation, we can confirm that we have the nickel 4 Ti3 precipitate in the matrix. If we zoom it a bit in the, the same grain, we can see the bright field images and also existence of these precipitates that in the left one and the right one in the higher magnification, you see the presence of these precipitates in the array, in the sequence. Why they form is like this, because when the first precipitates form, there is a strain field around it, and this strain field will cause another nucleation site for the formation of the next one. Because of that, you see at the sequence of the formation of these precipitates. 
If we go more in the high magnification and we see the atomic resolution here, you can see that the precipitates are present, but they are very, very small. That in the left one, you can see that uh, the precipitates are around 5 nanometer, and they are shown by the red arrows. And also in a better resolution in the right one, you see also the presence of the different kind of the bit larger precipitates that they have a size around 10 nanometer. So if I, can, uh, if I focus on one of these precipitates that you can see in the uh, blue square, that uh, I have done uh, on the high resolution images, I have filtered out that in the filtered high resolution images, you can see clearly the position of these precipitates. And in the inverse fast Fourier transform, you see only one family of the plane. This is only the plane that you can see as a line in this plane. Uh, between the precipitate and the matrix. But intrinsically, as these precipitates are small, but we can detect the existence of the misfit dislocation on the interface between the precipitates and the matrix. That is shown by the number of 1 and 2. If you look carefully, you can see the extra half plane. That is the indication of the presence of the dislocation that I'm showing here. And also in the number 2, you can see the extra half plane. If I do the GPA analysis, that is the geometrical phase analysis that shows the strain map of the high resolution images, the dislocation are shown by the hot spots because you know that, the, for example, if you have a edge dislocation, when one atomic plane is inserted in your mat matrix, you have the uh, compression and the tensile on the opposite side of this extra half plane. Because of that, the hot spots that is shown as a yellow and blue is the indication of the presence of the dislocation that is also consistent with the number one and two that you can see that they are formed in the uh, interface that uh, we call this, they are not completely coherent precipitate, they are kind of uh, semi-coherent precipitates. Now we do the same material, but after the formation of the 9%, we want to see that what happened to the microstructure and what's the effect of this deformation that uh, caused this long or large elongation. The left image shows the bright field image. As you can see, now we can see the shape of the formation of the martensite that has now uh, returned to the austenite. So we see the shape kind of the martensite phase, but because of the formation of the lot of dislocations, the interface doesn't have uh, the enough energy to return to its original austenite grains boundary. But martensite can f easily, this interface remain, but all the matrix, or let's say the structure, has changed to the B2. So you only see the shape of the uh, a previously formed martensite plane. On the other hand, if you look carefully on the left image, you can see the presence of the residual martensite that is shown as a white band here. So even that after the formation, we have the residual uh, martensite. In the right side, more intrinsically, you can see that uh, there is a presence of some kind of the structure in the grains. These are the uh, formation, indication of the formation of the low angle twist boundary. So imagine that you have a grain and it's twisted. And on this twisted plane, the screw dislocation start to form and go to the matrix. And because of that, if you look in the plan view direction, you see this kind of the structure that is the indication of the formation of this low angle twist boundaries. So if I do the selected area diffraction pattern on this grain, it shows the presence of the 111 zone axis of the B2. But if you remember the first diffraction pattern before the formation, we had a super reflection that is the indication of the precipitates. But now, we don't have any indication of the formation of the precipitates. So the precipitates are, let's say, gone. So what really happens, it means that when you're deforming your sample, this location is start to nucleate, and it starts to interact with the precipitates. When they are interacting with the precipitates, precipitates become, there is an antiphase boundary formed inside the precipitates, and the energy in the this precipitate increases, and if the critical radius of this um, precipitate is lower than the critical stress that can be stable for that precipitate, the precipitate starts to dissolve. So this is the mechanism of the shearing by the dislocations, 
and dissolving the precipitates that we see it here. But surprisingly, if we look at the high resolution images, we see sometimes some larger precipitates that still survived. So if I do the same kind of the local Z map or the strain mapping around this interface of the precipitates with the matrix, you can see that the number of the dislocation in the interface is increased. And in the inverse FFT in the right side, it shows the presence of this extra half plane. So what happens normally, if the dislocation start to form, they interact with the smaller precipitates, they shear it and dissolve it. But for the larger ones, they form an O of one loop around these precipitates. But since this interface still is kind of the coherent and has a lot of strain energy, this O of one loop are absorbed by this interface. Because of that, you see a lot of dislocation around this interface. We also did the uh, rotary bending fatigue test on this material after two minutes and three minutes, but we didn't see a lot of changes between this fatigue behavior. Uh, that we believe that if we increase the amount of the strain for this, we may see this effect of the dissolving and the shearing the precipitates for the also fatigue behavior. So if I conclude my talk, we saw the unusual and uh, increase in the ductility or elongation of the nickel titanium wires that uh, was aged at 575 degrees C for three minutes and 550 degrees C for 30 minutes. And during this deformation, the smaller precipitates start to dissolve by the passage of dislocation and shearing, but the larger ones survive and forms the or one loop around them that is kind of the uh, responsible mechanism for the larger elongation. So what we can propose as a mechanism is that once you're deforming your sample, First, the dislocation interact with the smaller precipitates, and most probably for the two minutes, we have already very small precipitates. They are all dissolved because of that the elongation or the ductility is very low. But if we have, the, for three minutes, we have a larger precipitate, these are holding our deformation and they form the oral loop and the hardening mechanism, and they can increase the elongation and ductility. Thanks a lot and for your uh, attention.